Welcome to the global series of uh, Bhadas for Media. Today we are excited to have with us one of the most renowned astronomers we have today, uh, Professor Avi Loeb from Harvard University. Welcome, Professor Loeb. How are you today? Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for the uninitiated, I'll give some introduction. Uh, Professor Loeb is leading the teams like the Black Hole Initiative and the Starshot Initiative. And uh, he has told me to, to, to call him uh, with the name Avi. So now I will refer to him as Avi. <laughs> yeah. So today we will try to understand what kind of work is being done under um, the initiatives that he's, uh, he's taken on. And uh, uh, he's also the longest serving chair of the Harvard Astronomy Department since last 10 years. And uh, another interesting discussion would be around the Oumuamua object what it is, what, why it is a curious case, and what implications it brings to humanity. We will discuss all that. And then Avi has also written a book about extraterrestrials uh, that talks about Oumuamua and the related science. The name of the book is Extraterrestrial, the first sign of intelligent life beyond Earth. Uh, so Avi, let's start with the scientific initiatives you are working on, uh, Black Hole Initiative and Starshot Initiative. So we would like to understand what, what they are and how they are going to change the science in the coming years. Yes, uh, these two initiatives are very different in their nature. Um, the one common denominator is that Stephen Hawking came uh, in April 2016 to inaugurate both of them. Uh, the first was the Starshot Initiative in New York City, uh, and the second was the Black Hole Initiative at Harvard University. So let me start with the Black Hole Initiative. That's a center, a research center, the only one in the world dedicated to the study of black holes. And uh, uh, back when we established it, it was a subject of academic interest for a limited community of people. And we wanted to uh, bring together philosophers uh, and scientists, mathematicians, astronomers, and uh, physicists that are interested in black holes to explore it. And in fact, uh, the first image of a black hole was obtained in the conference room of the Black Hole Initiative at Harvard. Uh, and you've seen this image a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, so, um, and Stephen Hawking, of course, uh, felt that it's uh, very dear to his heart because he worked on black holes for many years when it was in the fringes of physics. And it, as it turns out, uh, <laughs> Just around the time when we inaugurated the Black Hole Initiative, uh, the first gravitational wave signal was uh, reported from the edge of the universe oh. that involved the two black holes colliding. And uh, according to Einstein's theory of gravity, uh, space and time are not rigid. They, are, uh, they can be curved around objects. And so when two black holes collide, they generate a storm in space time. And those waves, just like waves on the surface of a pond, can propagate a large distance and the LIGO experiment was sensitive enough to detect them. And then the Nobel Prize was awarded for that. So that not only was it the first detection of gravitational waves, direct detection, but it's, so it's not just the uh, messenger that uh, was rewarded, but also the message uh, that uh, indicated that black holes exist. And I should point out that Albert Einstein <laughs> in the 1930s argued that black holes don't exist and gravitational waves don't exist. So he made two mistakes uh, on this issue that were confirmed simultaneously with the LIGO experiment. Uh, and just to show you that at the frontier, when you work at the frontier, it, you don't know which path to take and sometimes you make mistakes, but that's the nature of innovation. Uh, you have to allow that in order to innovate. Uh, you have to take risks. You have to put some skin in the game. And unfortunately, as we will discuss, the current culture in academia is avoiding that. People prefer not to be tested by experiments and work on concepts that have no connection to reality so that they can um, always be right because they do mathematics and also get honors and awards and never make mistakes. And that's very unfortunate. At any event, um, in addition to the Black Hole Initiative, now, uh, so now we are, um, um, uh, four, year, four and a half years into, into the operation of it. Um, I should say also that uh, there was a second Nobel Prize awarded for black holes, and uh, that, is, uh, that was for the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, and this is the Nobel Prize of 2020. 
So in just a matter of uh, the four and a half years, there were two Nobel Prizes, and now black holes are in vogue. They are very much in fashion, and uh, a lot of people are working on them. So we had 2020 hindsight uh, about this subject when we established the Black Hole Initiative, and we have postdocs and visitors. Um, the second initiative is the Starshot Initiative, and uh, that's a very different one. And um, it started when uh, uh, an entrepreneur from Silicon Valley uh, named Yuri Milner uh, came out of a black limousine that parked in front of the Center for Astrophysics yeah. and came to my office. Uh, he sat on the sofa and asked me, would you be willing to lead a project to visit the nearest star within our lifetime? And he, he's roughly the same age as I am, 59. Uh, and I said, okay, that means two decades and the nearest star is four light years away. Even light takes four years to get there. Uh, so it means that you need a spacecraft that moves at a fifth of the speed of light together in 20 years. And uh, it was not obvious to me that that's feasible. I told him I'll work with, with my students and postdocs to identify the technology that can do that. And uh, we identified a light sail technology, meaning a sail that is pushed by light. And uh, if you shine a very powerful laser beam of 100 gigawatts on a sail roughly the size of a person that weighs a gram or a few grams, over a few minutes, it will reach a fifth of the speed of light across a distance which is five times the distance to the moon. So the idea is to produce the technologies associated with this concept and we are working on that and the project is funded um, uh, by Yuri Milner and um, it's very exciting. It's the first step towards going beyond the solar system. And of course, such a, a mission would bring a camera to perhaps the habitable planet near the nearest star, Proxima Centauri. There is a Proxima B, that's a, a planet 20 times closer to the star than the Earth is from the sun, but the star itself is a dwarf star. Yeah. And uh, it would be very exciting to see if there, are, there is any life there. And um, we are working on the development of that. Okay, great. Uh, so, yeah, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, Stephen Hawking visited your home in Lexington. And yes. then you started these two initiatives, right? Uh, that was very uh, interesting because um, he came with uh, a, a guards and, of course, a, a group of people that they took took care of him, uh, they can, uh, we had to build a ramp that allows him to enter our home. And, uh, uh, and then uh, we hosted him for Passover, which is a special dinner once a year that uh, the, the Jewish people uh, have. And uh, he enjoyed it very much. He ate everything that my wife gave him and uh, uh, also gave a speech in which he talked about uh, the two initiatives that we inaugurated uh, together. And uh, I found him to be a remarkable person because anyone in his conditions that cannot move a muscle uh, okay. would be extremely depressed. And he gave a sense of optimism. You know, in one of the evenings, he said to his caretakers, he said, I'm bored. Why don't we go to the bar and have some fun? You know, he, he was full of life right. and was optimistic. And I think it's a lesson for all of, all of us. Uh, he represents the limit of... Uh, uh, you know, un being unable to function and uh, nevertheless maintain this optimism. So any of us that is in difficult, you know, circumstances has to think about him and it will give you inspiration. And you know what um, uh, uh, Oscar Wilde said uh, more than a century ago, he said, all of us are in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Wow. Yeah, that's true. And yeah, uh, I mean, any, anybody who has met uh, Stephen Hawking in his lifetime is very, very fortunate one. And yeah, your family is then very fortunate. Yeah, he, he was very inspirational. And uh, my daughter in particular uh, and loved him. And uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, aside from his major contributions to physics, he's a symbol of um, maintaining optimism despite uh, physical constraints. Yeah, and, right. uh, you know, I, I thought about it when uh, during the pandemic, you know, I developed a new routine that every morning at 5 a.m. I jog into the woods, the local woods in the company of birds, ducks and uh, rabbits. I enjoy nature very much because I was born on a farm and 
Uh, and, and one day I slipped and hit my head on a rock. It was a slippery day. It was rainy. And uh, then I came back uh, wounded. I came back home and we had to, to go to a hospital. But I thought to myself, okay, this is a very mild uh, step in the direction of Stephen Hawking. If, if, if he can be so optimistic, you know, I should just ignore it. And uh, the following day I, I went jogging once again at 5 a.m. <laughs> Great. So yeah, uh, he's an inspiration for you, for, for me, for every one of us. Okay, so uh, so Avi, the, the, the uh, next question is, uh, uh, your book says, uh, uh, the, the, the name of the book is The First Sign of Intelligent Life. So that is a very bold statement in itself. So can we discuss why and how uh, Oumuamua could be a first sign of intelligent life? Yes, so Oumuamua is uh, the first object discovered near Earth that came from outside the solar system. And um, it's sort of like finding an object in your backyard that came from the street. And uh, it saves you the time to go to the street and see what's out there because you de detect it near you. And at first astronomers thought uh, it was discovered in Hawaii. The name Oumuamua simply means scout in the Hawaiian language. And the astronomers that discovered it thought, oh, it must be a comet. Uh, but the problem was that it didn't show any cometary tail. Uh, comets are rocks covered with ice. And when they get close to, the, to a star like the sun, the, the ice warms up and you end up with vapor and dust uh, enshrouding them. And uh, there wasn't anything that was seen. And uh, so it was definitely not a comet. I mean, the Spitzer Space Telescope looked very deeply around it and didn't find any carbon-based molecules, nothing. And then um, as it was tumbling over eight hours, uh, the brightness of the object changed by a factor of 10. And the brightness stems from reflection of sunlight by the object. So that meant the area of the object projected on the sky was changing by a factor of 10 as it was spinning, tumbling. And imagine a piece of paper tumbling in the wind. A factor of 10 changing the area is a lot. And uh, actually it turns out the best fit to the variation of the light with time was that of a flat object, a pancake shape, not cigar shape, the way it was shown in some uh, cartoons. Okay. So you have a pancake shaped object and uh, no cometary tail. And then it exhibited an extra push away from the sun uh, that could not be supplied by the rocket effect because you have no evaporation. So the question is what gave it this extra push? And I suggested in a scientific paper that it may be just the reflection of sunlight. It may be a light sail. Uh, and for that, it needs to be very thin. And the nature doesn't produce light sails. So uh, the conclusion was that it may well be artificial. And actually just a few months ago, in September, 2020, there was another object detected that exhibited push away from the sun due to reflected sunlight and had no cometary tail. And uh, this one was discovered by PanStars, the same telescope the astronomers were able to track it back in time and notice that in 1966, it came from the Earth. And there was actually a rocket booster that was kicked into space back then. It was hollow and thin. And that explains why it was pushed by reflecting sunlight. So here you have an artificial object that we produced. We know who produced it, but we don't know who produced Oumuamua. Yeah. Uh... So uh, mm, I, uh, I have actually gone through that paper and also your book. Uh, and then uh, uh, in some literature, I find that actually this object is stationary and a solar system because it is moving uh, in space. So it is banging into the object, something like that. Yeah, it's well, it's moving. It's definitely interstellar in the sense that it's moving too fast to be bound to the sun. Yeah. And uh, therefore, we know it came from outside the solar system. But then... Um, uh, it was one other peculiar fact about it is that it was at rest in a frame called the local standard of rest. And this frame is the frame you get to when you average the motions of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun. So it's sort of like the local galactic parking lot. And it was at rest there. And only one in 500 stars are so much at rest as it was. So if it came from a star, you know, it's very unusual, one in 500 chance. And the question is, why was it in that special frame? And the only reason that the sun bumped into it is because the sun moves relative to the local standard of rest. Yeah. So the sun was just like a giant ship bumping into a buoy 
which is at rest on the surface of the ocean. 